why does our society seem to be overly preoccupied with measurement and things we can measure? Like, it seems like no matter what job I have, I'm probably focused on the increasing of some number or decreasing of some number. Why is it that measurement plays such an important role in our society? Uh, that goes pretty deep. But you're right. Um, you know, government often makes its decisions based on uh, some kind of cost benefit analysis. Uh, in fact, scientific policymaking is essentially like, what do, you, what do we mean? And this is part of the answer to this. Like, what do we mean by science? What is science actually? The way I define it to myself, at least, is that science is the study of what we can measure. And this isn't only my definition. This goes back to Newton and Galileo, actually. If it's not measurable, if you can't put a number on it, then it's kind of fuzzy, you know, it's kind of qualitative. It's not really scientific. So our culture um, has aspired to be more and more scientific, to bring the things that we couldn't measure, those kind of fuzzy nebulous things into the realm of measurement, into the realm of science, and therefore into the realm of control. Because if you can completely understand something and quantify the causes and effects that drive a phenomenon, then you can control it too. If you know, um, trying to think of an example here. Well, I'll just say that, that uh, measurement is a kind of uh, domination or kind of control that allows us to do incredible things with technology. Technology comes from science. You can build a bridge or build a microchip or build an airplane if you have the ability to quantify the phenomena that you're working with. Um, you know, engineers use formulas. You know, they calculate stress loads if they're building a bridge, things like that. So we get tremendous power from quantification. We get the ability to order the world into the image of our desires. And that's very appealing. Secondly, the uh, mindset of quantification is deeply tied into the mindset of money. That's how you make a rational decision in the paradigm of economics. You, and, and economics basically teaches this about ourselves. It says that human beings make decisions in order to maximize their rational self-interest. And what is rational self-interest? It's, in economics at least, it's money. So this way of thinking is very deeply ingrained. And I think that, yeah, I think like you could really take it down again to science that says that what is real is measurable. So if we want to better ourselves, we need to measure more and get more of those things that we now we know exactly what it is. Well, then is there something that gets lost, you know, by the simple act of measuring something? I mean, you know, it seems like we're focusing on only maybe one attribute of a thing when we measure or a couple attributes that we can measure about that thing. But if there's attributes about that thing that are immeasurable, do those get lost then when we try to measure things? Yeah, of course. I mean, any, anything that you can't measure or choose not to measure gets ignored. So for example, today when environmentalism has turned more and more toward carbon, then anything, any environmental measure that uh, in some measurable way reduces carbon emissions, that gets a lot of attention and a lot of support. And anything that doesn't serve that function kind of gets ignored. So like, how about saving the whales? You know, how about whale conservation? How about um, pharmaceutical residue in the water? Things like that. Those kind of become secondary issues. They get sidelined side because what we're gearing policy around now are these carbon metrics. So too bad for the whales. You know, too bad for the elephants. It doesn't seem that they contribute in any way to, to you know, uh, levels of greenhouse gases. They get left out. 
And let's take GDP also. Um, when a nation pursues a policy of economic growth and increasing GDP, what could get left out would be maybe inequality. Maybe the overall GDP is growing, but it's at the cost of greater and greater inequality. But if you're not measuring that and, and um, feeding that measure into the policymaking apparatus, then inequality can get worse and worse and you won't even necessarily know about it. Now you can, now people do measure inequality, but there are more subtle things that are not measured when you're talking about GDP, such as uh, leisure time, such as depression, such as the divorce rate, like things like that are not part of economic thinking. So if you gear your policy apparatus toward increasing GDP or even decreasing inequality, these other things are, are also not going to become, um, they're not going to feed into the, into the policies. They get left out. Thank you. Um, uh, you, know, what, you know, so we have a system here and a society that is putting almost all of its focus on things that it can measure. But we've had other type of cultures that lived on this world that didn't do that. They didn't overly focus on measurement and maybe they didn't even measure most things. What type of, you know, value system or society, you know, puts more value or, or, or puts emphasis at least on the things that it can't measure? Is there, a, you know, because we have a certain value system that creates a desire to measure in our society. And are there different, is there a different set of values, a different kind of culture, a different kind of society, you know, that has in the past maybe um, put more emphasis on those, on the things we can't measure? Um, and, and what type of value system, you know, would lead us towards that kind of society? I think probably uh, every society for ours, uh, or not in the dominant civilization, lived much less according to, um, lived much less quantitatively. I think that's just kind of human nature. I mean, um, like for example, the idea of value. It's only recently that we've mapped value onto a linear scale and said that you know, like, cause ordinarily, like you can't compare apples and oranges to use a cliched metaphor, right? Because an apple is an apple and an orange is an orange. And if you say, well, which do you like better? Well, you know, sometimes one, sometimes the other, but when everything becomes part of a market economy, then you can say, well, an apple is worth, you know, 69 cents and an orange is worth 74 cents. So the orange is better. It's more valuable. So what happens is then, then we take the, kind of infinite diversity of the world and, and of uh, human preferences and human beings. And our, uh, we take all that uniqueness and diversity and we collapse it onto a linear scale. So one thing becomes less valuable than another thing. Gold becomes more valuable than silver. Um, truffles become more valuable than oranges. And in the end, one person becomes more valuable than another person, more worthy of life because they can pay for the medical care and the other person can't. They can pay to live outside the pollution zone and another person can't. Um, they can buy the expensive supplements and another person can't. So anyway, you can see that, that the doctrine of value as expressed by the money system really reduces the complexity and diversity of life. And therefore it all becomes about the money, you know? I mean, some of these questions seem kind of like set up questions, you know? Okay. That, that you kind of know what you want me to say and so forth. I'd like a question that is really alive for you that you're like, like something that just doesn't add up in the way you're seeing the world. And you're just like, man, I just don't know what to do about this. Gosh. Um, yeah. 
I don't know what to do about, you know, um, you know, the, the thing that bothers me a lot is, you know, the, the, the desire to control the world that, um, you know, that you have coming from a lot of um, government officials um, who, you know, want the surveillance state and they want to interfere with other people, other countries, politics. And, um, and there's just like this seemingly insatiable need to like, um, you know, uh, control practically, you know, the elections of every, every country in the world or, or whatever. And, and I wish, you know, that I, I lived in a country that respected other countries and respected other peoples. So that's something I don't really understand. Um, and I'm curious if that has anything related to, you know, this, um, you know, perhaps desire to measure the immeasurable or. Um, yeah. So we happen to live in the, United States of America, which is the hegemon. It's the seat of the global empire. Uh, we could live in another country. We could move to New Zealand or something like that. Um, and then we would live in a country that isn't the hegemon. Or we could move to Sudan and live in a country that's being brutalized by the empire. And then maybe we would get to like ourselves more because we're not living in the dominant country, but what would change? So the question for me is, is yeah, like where does this will to dominate come from? And how can we serve a change in the world so that no country is the dominator? Yeah. Yeah. And I don't know, I mean, we could go back historically, the history of the nation state, you know, we could look at the global financial system that requires the submission of more and more people to the conversion of their nature, their place, their community into products in order to feed the growth machine. And you have to have somebody administering and enforcing um, conformity to the program of development. So you need a military power to, to do that, you know, because people resist it. People resist having their lives converted into money to have their traditions uh, obliterated so that they can become consumers and employees uh, in a globalized economy. Like people don't want that. They, they, there's, there are many forms of resistance that need to be um, overcome for the system to keep going. So in a way, like the imperialistic behavior of the United States, it's not because the United States is bad, you know, it's playing a systemically necessary role in the kind of system that we have today. If we weren't doing it, then it would be happening some other way. And in fact, we might be looking at the decline of American empire uh, and a different kind of administration of the world destroying machine. There may not be a single hegemon on top, yet the power centers of the world can still conspire to um, maintain the system of wealth stripping that's going on. It just wouldn't flow as much to the United States. It might flow to, you know, the various elite capitals of the world, or it might flow to China, or who knows, you know? So to me, like, you know, so I'm not saying to ignore the, the atrocities and depredations of uh, imperial power, because it that does show us, like when we see that stuff, we realize what we've bought into here. And it makes the whole shebang a lot less palatable. So, but, but I think that it has to be seen more as, as kind of a, a, a diagnostic symptom of, of a whole system rather than the cause of the suffering in the world. 
it is a cause of suffering in the world, but it's not the deepest cause. What is the deepest cause? I mean, how far back do you want to go? You know, like I was just taking it to the financial system, the money system, the economy, but you could also ask, well, what um, state of being or what phase of civilizational development gives rise to this kind of economy? How does it, what does it sit in? What's it embedded in? And that's why I go to what I call the story of separation. The idea that we are separate from each other, separate from nature, that, that we live in a mechanical world of stuff. That human well-being comes through domination and control of the uh, random forces of nature and competing other beings, competing other people, germs, animals, weeds, you know, and that we'll be better off if we can dominate and conquer all of those with antibiotics and pesticides and surveillance and drones. Like, will be on top. Like that worldview of separation and worldview of growth that, that says that you know, our destiny and our highest aspiration uh, should be to expand the human realm, to conquer the wild, to civilize the, the planet, to turn it into uh, our own production facility so that we can get more and more of what we want and need like that, that's a deep story. I would even call it a mythology. It comes along with, with um, metaphysical teachings, you know, of what the world is and who we are, what it is to be, what's real. It goes that deep. And that means that a healed planet and a healed society, will that'll only happen if we also change the level of mythology. If we have change on that level too, the revolution has to go that deep. It's not about just like overthrowing whatever hegemonic power is in place right now. Because what elevates that power is the underlying stories of who we are, what the world is, why we're here, what's real. So in a way then you could say that, that anything we do to subvert that story which could even just be personal stuff, like living and relating in a way that violates the story of a bunch of separate selves out there competing for maximum self-interest. That is a political act. It's a revolutionary act because it changes the substructure, uh, the narrative substructure of the world that we live in. And I'm not saying that that's like the only kind of thing that we should do because Often it's not, you know, statements of principle that disrupt a story, but it's how, you, how a person responds um, in the face of challenges, in the face of injustice, in the face of, of situations that demand courage. Like when you step up to protect what's beautiful to you. The For innocent, example, yeah. the innocent animals, something like that. Like when we protect well, I was thinking of the DAPL, you know, the oh. Dakota Access Pipeline. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's thousands, you know, thousands of people went up there without, I mean, to no benefit of their own. Like, what do they get from it? Cold temperatures, maybe some. Yeah. Uh, I mean, maybe like some of them get psychological. Something. Maybe they get some psychological benefits, like, you know, oh, I get to be a do-gooder, I get to be an activist, I'm on the side of right. But those kind of motives are, are there. And in fact, I would say to the extent that those motives are there, the action will be less successful. But in most of the people there, the, the, the most authentic motive was to protect what's beautiful, to protect what's sacred, you know, to protect the water. Anytime you do that, you're violating the story. If you're doing it for that and not to look, you know, to signal your virtue, but you're really doing it because you care about something, you're changing the story, you're changing the field. So intention has a lot to do with it, 
what is our intention for our acts that we do? You know, um, is our intention to make ourselves look good or is our intention actually to, you know, bring more understanding, bring more peace, bring more, um, it's a matter of what do you serve? Yeah. The whole thing about setting an intention, I mean, it could be, it can be a useful way to clarify uh, what you're doing and why you're doing it to yourself. But it's also prone to a lot of self delusion because there might be other intentions hiding behind the explicit intention. So, I would say, uh, the way I, I usually think of it is to clarify your aim, to clarify what, what is it that I'm in service to. And then to sometimes realize that, wow, I've been in service to two things that are becoming contradictory. I've been in service to healing the world, and I've also been in service to looking good doing it. So that's why I've wanted to get the credit. That's why I've wanted to be the leader. That's why I've wanted to make sure everyone knows that I'm doing this and, and have everyone know that I'm right. Okay. So that's two different things that I'm serving. And for a while, the contradiction between those two may not be visible, but at some point there will be a clarifying moment where you get to choose which one you're going to serve. And at that moment, it might mean stepping back from leadership. It might mean doing something that no one's watching that doesn't look good to anybody. It doesn't put you in a position where you're admired. Like those are the powerful moments where there's just, your mind has no way of making it okay to the ego because I'm gonna get something good from this. It's purely an act of service. That really shifts the field of this planet. I think that's really helpful advice. Um, you know, what am I serving in each moment? Am I, and, and to ask that question can be very clarifying. Um, it's a clarifying question, right? Mm -hmm. To yourself. Well, I mean, it's important to me. What I know when I think about what I'm serving, um, you know, I really want to serve, um, the, um, promotion or the, or the idea that, you know, um, that we can create a society that takes care of everybody and including the biosphere, including the animals, including the, nat the wild animals who, um, I know Dawn and I care, you know, and so do so many others, but are always focused on how they're always left out. You know, they can't speak to us in our language. They can speak to us in other languages, but not in our language. So we tend to think they're not important or they're, and their needs tend to go um, unmet. And, 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 and many times um, they're treated as things. They're not even really live beings. They're not beings like we are in many cases. And, and I know that that's something that we keep in mind a lot um, and it's something that's very important to us to serve is to just be able to speak for those who, you know, can't speak for themselves. And I guess that goes for, you know, other, obviously it goes for other communities who, um, you know, aren't connected to the internet and can't tell their stories and can't, you know, um, um, uh, communicate their values of their society. I think that's something that's really important to both Don and I um, in terms of, you know, what, what we serve. What about you, Charles? What, what is it that, uh, that you feel like you're serving? In your work, in your travels? In I mean, I call it the more beautiful world my heart knows is possible. It's a, uh, where I could say I'm serving the future and not just any future, but a particular future that's revealed itself to me as possible through experiences that I've had, people I've met, um, moments I've had you know, with just even looking into somebody's eyes and seeing how divine and how beautiful they are, how gifted they are, how 
deeply desiring they are to express their gifts and service. And I'm like, wow, a world could be built on this, on this human nature that I'm seeing. Where I'll see like incredible permaculture projects, you know, or social projects that, that again, give me that feeling like the world could be built on this. So I've been shown like these, these are kind of like threads of like this gigantic golden ball of, of, of thread, you know, that's the future that these threads kind of tendril back into the present and, and I catch a glimpse of them. And then in my mind, I follow them to their source and I'm, and, and I'm like, wow, like that's what the world could be. So I'm, I could say that I'm as best as I can in service to that. And that, you know, part of that is what you're saying in service to life. And life is one of those things to go back to our earlier theme that you can't really measure when you take life and reduce it down to a bunch of molecules or a bunch of chemicals, something is lost. It's beingness is lost. So, yeah, like I resonate with what you were saying about, about the animals and I would ex- expand that to like the soil, um, the bacteria, even the plants. I mean, the, the system that we live in is perpetrating a Holocaust that, and that's a word I don't use lightly, um, but a Holocaust on life. Uh, one of the things that came up in my book research that was the, I'm calling it the insect Holocaust, where the, have you noticed that there's not as much bug splatter on your windshield as there was when you were a kid? Um, I mean, I, I hadn't really thought about it until now, but yeah, now that you mentioned yeah. it. I have I can I can now notice that I don't have very much bug splatter. I mean I live right. in the desert, so it might be something to do with that, but um Well I don't live in the desert. I live in okay. you know a very green area and I I can go on, you know, an hours long highway drive and like there might be a couple bugs. But when I was a kid, like you used to have to stop at the gas station and scrape them off, you know. And I, I mentioned this to my father, you know, when he was a kid in like the forties and fifties like there were clouds of insects. Like, you know, you couldn't even drive at full speed sometimes. So, I, but I, you know, was wondering if this was my imagination too. And so I came across all this research that is documenting a decline in flying insect biomass of about 80% over 30 years. Now, insects are at the, at the crux of every terrestrial food chain. I mean, they are fundamental to life on land. An 80% decline in insects means an 80% decline in life. It means that the biosphere is dying. That's what that means. And we could also talk about earthworms. Or fish in the sea. Fish, yep. Uh, fish biomass is at a similar decline. We could talk about um, the, the um, fungi in the soil too, and the bacteria in the soil that industrial agriculture destroys uh, and reduces to like a small subset, a small and pathological subset of what it's supposed to be. So yeah, this is, to me, this is more concerning than, than climate change. And people, you know, in the I call it the rush to the cause. They want to find a linear cause, like a one cause that explains everything. So they're like, well, the decline in insect biomass must be because of climate change. But if only, <laughs> if only we could solve all our problems by switching to a different fuel source. But actually, it's probably be- because of this 80 or 90 year experiment that we've done of constantly dumping poison into the, into the environment. And which, you know, I'm talking about insecticides, pesticides, fungicides, et cetera, et cetera, just dowsing the land with these things, even places you think are pristine, like the mountain ridge behind my brother's farm, state forest land, you know, it looks like nothing's happening there, but they come and spray it every year because of, I don't know, gypsy moths or dungay fever or whatever they're afraid of, you know, the solution is 
kill some stuff. Like that is a pretty general solution in our society. <laughs> you do that a lot, don't you? <laughs> yeah. So, you know, so yeah. These beings that you're talking about that have no voice. I mean, we have to expand those to include soil, water, insects. Not, I mean, even it's, it's almost easier to extend in our current paradigm, it's almost easier to extend compassion to the cute, you know, koala bears and grizzly bears and elephants and stuff like that. The other mammals, right? Right. But, but. Because <laughs> they look more like us, perhaps, you know, right. nose, two eyes and mouth and the same. Right. Usually more and, and when, you, when you kill them, they make, um, you know, heartbreaking noises. Uh, but you can't hear the soil scream. But that doesn't mean it's not. So, yeah, I would say that where that, that really the shift is to being in service to life, to the well being, the flourishing of life, and to the evolution of life. Because we humans have unique gifts. We're here for a reason. These gifts are here for a reason. We're not just supposed to bow out, get out of the way. But even to ask that question, what is our reason here? Like, if it's not to dominate and destroy, if it's not to create a concrete world with algae pools for oxygen and, and synthetic food and digital experiences, and bubble cities, air filters, carbon sucking machines, like that's the concrete world. If it's not that, then, then what is it? What is it in a mutual relationship to the rest of life? Like, what are we here to do together? To even ask that question is new. Mm. And that's well, where it's got to start. I don't have the answer to it. Well, aren't we here to make profit? I mean, aren't we here to increase GDP? I mean, that's what we would answer that question well, with if we... Yeah, I mean, no one, no one actually says it that way, but... Um, in essence, the, that's what drives the conversion of the planet into a gigantic strip mine and waste dump. But, but to even ask the question, like to open that space, why are we here? What are we here to serve? What are we here to do together with the rest of life? I was saying, I don't have an answer to that, but the question itself, when it's asked sincerely, constitutes a kind of a prayer that will bring answers to us. I've, I can see a different way of being in the world where um, the focus is on the reduction of suffering, of not just our own suffering, but the suffering of the soil, the suffering of the animals. What do they need? We, we, we have the ability to look at a um, piece of, you know, some part of the environment and kind of ask the question, how can I, how can I, what does, it, what does the environment need? What does this yeah. you know, environment looking for? And how can I help to bring that to it? You know, here we are with these hands and thumbs and stuff and we can manipulate things, but can we bring things to the environment that it, that it might need to be thriving to say, Hey, maybe life can thrive in this environment. If I, you know, helped it in this way. Yeah, so, so I think that our conceptual language does not equip us right now to be able to answer the question, why are we here? So to say like the reduction of suffering. So, okay, uh, your average frog, your average mama frog lays maybe a couple thousand eggs in her lifetime. Let's say I'm making this up, but it's something like that, right? How many of those little tadpoles actually get to grow up to be a frog. The rest of them die a gruesome death. They get devoured, terrible things happen to them. A duck comes and snaps them, you know, like, like there's a lot of suffering in nature. There's a lot of death in nature. So are we gonna, you know, try to create a world in which we neuter most of the frogs so that they don't have babies so that not so many baby frogs have to die? Like, are we, is that, that, um, phobia of death, that kind of exclusion of death mm. into the realm of, you know, this is what we want to conquer and avoid. That's part of the problem. 
for me, it's not so much about whether you suffer or not, but it's about, did you live the right life? Have you expressed your life force fully? That's what's important to me. Like I'm willing to suffer sometimes if that's part of the full expression of my life force. Mm. Our society puts first priority, not on full expression, but on safety. Safety first, security. You see it on the playground, you see it in national foreign policy. And that comes from, again, the, the mythology of the separate self. Who I am is a separate individual. Therefore, the most important thing is my survival because there is nothing else beyond that. So part of the transition is away from that. So I don't, I mean, I guess it depends on really what you mean by suffering because there's a deep suffering in that feeling of confinement and um, not being able to fully express my life force. But yeah, I guess yeah. what I'm thinking of is like if I were to go to a barren place um, where there's not much life, um, you know, perhaps, perhaps a, a part of the land that's been deforested and, you know, where there used to be a thriving rainforest and now that's all been chopped down and now it's barren or even turned to desert. And I say, okay, well, that desert, you know, life could thrive here if I perhaps helped to plant more trees and to mm -hmm. regenerate the forest and bring back the conditions where all of life can thrive. And yeah, it means partly part of thriving is suffering because there is an end to our lives and that can be seen as suffering. Um, but to create the conditions where that just happens over and over again more often. So because, you know, in the barren landscape, we just don't have as much life. And if everything becomes that way, then life won't exist at all. Right. So, so I guess it's the process of life that thrives mm -hmm. more than just life itself thriving. Right. Is, can we create the conditions for, you know, all of life to go through the process that it, that life goes through in, you know, in perpetuity and, and yeah. for, for uh, millions of years to come because the earth's going to be around for many more millions or billions of years, perhaps. Right. Uh, yeah, I, think, I think that that's, that's well put, you know, that, that whatever our purpose is as a species in the long run, right now, I think it's pretty obvious, which is to restore the damage that's been done. Um, the deserts that have spread because of human activity for six or 7,000 years. Uh, you know, Mongolia didn't used to be a desert. Um, the Sahara didn't used to be a desert. A lot of that's because of deforestation and poor water management practices. And people are doing things about it. Like this guy, um, Ernst Gosch, I think his name is, um, in Brazil, Centropic Agriculture, he calls it. You know, he went into this land 20 or 30 years ago. It was called the dry land. It was totally ruined. And he begins these restorative practices uh, chop and drop pruning, like just massive pruning, like things to rebuild topsoil really quickly. And now like, you know, all the springs that have been dried out have come back to life. Streams that had been seasonal or flowing year round. Um, species that hadn't been seen in the area for decades have come back, you know. Um, and he produces huge amounts of food at the same time. And some of the highest quality cacao beans in the world, et cetera, et cetera. Like, on just one little plot. I mean, imagine if everybody was devoting themselves to that, how beautiful this world could be, how abundant it could be. Yeah, we could do that. There are people doing that kind of thing already in service to life. Well, that gives, that's certainly a sign of hope um, to know that these are out there. And it sounds like, um, you know, we could, uh, we could help tell their stories and, and help uh, show people through our examples uh, once we figure out ways to, to be in service to, uh, um, you know, the process of life. Um, uh, that, uh, you know, we can spread those ideas. Yeah. Excellent, Charles. Thank you so much, you know, for uh, being here and, um, for uh, really helping all of us 
dive deeper. I, you know, you've made a huge impact, uh, you know, in, in, in my life um, uh, at a time when, you know, I didn't know what was up from down uh, in terms of the old economy, my role, what, who am I? And, you know, your work really kind of set the ball running for sustainable human um, for, you know, to give it some of uh, an alternative um, story to it that it can, you know, try to communicate and, um, you know, and live through example. So uh, I'm, I'm very grateful for, for what you've done and, um, and I'm sure many people, other people are as well. And so I just want to thank you again for your time and, uh, and for, for helping uh, shed some more light on this topic to our audience. Yeah, thanks for the conversation, Chris. I enjoyed it. Excellent. Yeah. All right.